Hello to all the folks who are hopping on to join us today. We are going to give it just one more minute, let a few people, a few more folks join us, and then we will get started. And a hello to the folks who are just hopping on. We're gonna get things going in just another minute here. All right, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. This is Rev Up Your Design Game, How Evolve Mechanical Boosts Productivity. Today's webinar is being presented by Seth Greenland, our mechanical product manager and an expert in all things related to mechanical design in Revit. Uh, today, Seth is gonna be discussing some of the uh, most imperative uh, features and tools that come in of Evolve Mechanical to make sure that um, you are getting the most out of your Evolve Mechanical experience and to um, help you find new ways to just improve your BIM process. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we'll forward the recording to all registrants. You can always find all of our webinar recordings over on the Evolve MEP YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them using the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar, and we may have some time at the end of the session to take a few questions. All right, and with that, I will pass it over to Seth to get us started today. All right. Thank you, Marina. Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to echo what she said. Uh, just uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, hopefully this will be informative for everybody here. Uh, again. There, there's going to be there should be some time for questions at the end, uh, but if at any point you think of a question along the way, uh, put it in the uh, Q and A should be along the bottom bottom end of your screen, and uh, we'll see if it makes sense to answer it on the fly or if it should be at the end. Uh, but don't want you to forget if you have a question. So if something comes to your mind, uh, put it in the Q and A, and we'll we'll have we should have time to address it. Um, so yeah, let's see. Let's take a quick look at the agenda, what we're going to cover here. Um, really, we're going to go over um, just a quick introduction to Evolve Mechanical uh, and just kind of introduce at a high level all of the tools and features and uh, uh, things that it has. Uh, we'll talk about it in a couple of different ways. One, by enhancing how it enhances automation. So things like hangers, things like sleeves, things that automate processes that normally take a whole lot of time. Uh, and then the, the second part, we'll look at uh, accelerating the design iterations. And these are going to be more like uh, quick tools. So uh, rotate tools, alignment tools, uh, offset tools, things that are going to help you with the design once it's already in, uh, or even design, you know, and, and, and uh, drawing as you're, as you're moving forward with your, with your project. And then, like I said, uh, Q&A session. Uh, like I said, we, we should have time there uh, to, to answer any questions that might come up along the way. Uh, so yeah, high level, looking at uh, spooling. We're going to be covering um, you know, spooling, sleeve placement, hanger placement, and the quick tools. Um, so it's basically what these all kind of make up is just a powerful set of productivity tools uh, that help you get more done quickly. Uh, Evolve Mechanical brings a lot of that functionality from CAD MEP into Revit that for some reason Autodesk left behind. Uh, so it, it it extends on top of that and something unfortunately we're not going to have a ton of time to go into today, but on top of that extends it extends data for scheduling reporting, um, which is something that if you know if anybody is working or has worked in CAD MEP and is now working in Revit, all of those great parameters and reporting functions that you uh, you wish you could use in in Revit schedules, you can with with Evolve Mechanical. Uh, so it also again provides that uh, a comprehensive set of quick tools to aid in efficiently designing a model, and then uh, automation tools like sleeves and prefab manager to allow for uh, 
efficient spooling directly in Revit. Uh, so yeah, I, I won't go really into these slides or this this slide here because this is kind of where we just jump into a demo. I've got a a model. I want to just kind of run through all of these things with you, and we'll we'll just go from there. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started here. I have just a pretty basic model here, but I have some ducts, some pipe, a few walls. There's a ceiling in here that's just hidden in this view. And we'll just kind of use this to, to go through all of the tools. And uh, I think best if we start with spooling. So what I'd like to do for spooling is just kind of showcase the different ways that we can define the spools. And then what happens once those spools are defined? How do we manage the sheets? How do we generate sheets? Uh, what can we do with those sheets? And so uh, throughout this exercise, I'll just kind of be going through all of that. And again, um, I'll just, I'll probably say this way too many times during this, but if you have any questions along the way, uh, put them in the, in the chat or in the Q and A section in the bottom. So I'm just gonna select this, uh, this, uh, this, system here and just isolate these elements just to make it a little easier for selection. And that's actually something we can talk about too, because we do have some tools that do uh, help with selection. And we'll see that echoed throughout the tools that we're going to be looking at today. But with our uh, spooling, we have two different ways to do this uh, primarily. Uh, one is define spool, and that's just going to be whatever I select is going to be included in that spool. So it's really more of just like just whatever you click, and that's just your standard Revit selection, uh, we can include in that spool. So as soon as I click that, I get my defined spool, and it's going to ask me to start uh, uh, define a, a starting name. What's really cool about this is I don't have to just do, you know, chilled water uh, supply dash 001. You know, of course, if I do that, it's going to increment to my next item or my next number as I go through. So if I select the next one, it's 002, 003, and so on. But what happens when I go to a different system? Then I have to go and type in the, the prefix or the abbreviation for that new system. So what we've done with our starting name is we allow basically to start and end and append information as a prefix or a suffix uh, to the number pretty much any parameter that could be associated to that to the, the, the pipes or fittings that you're selecting. So what I like to do um, is fabrication service abbreviation. So it's as simple as just selecting fabrication service abbreviation. It's even gonna put that the little open caret and caret in uh, to help me out with my syntax and just zero, zero. I'm actually gonna do zero, zero, five because I know I did this, I, I was working in this model before and I had defined some spools already. So um, I'll just start at five. Um, and on top of that, I can do uh, a, another uh, suffix here if, if I want to. Didn't mean to hit that button. Um, so I just start with another one here, and maybe I could do level. You know, maybe I'd want that before or after, but I can do, again, service abbreviation, CHWS005 level one. And so that spool name will carry through, and I can put that on my spool sheet. It's a really great way to automate uh, what's normally a pretty simple but tedious task, especially if you're dealing with multiple systems. Uh, so I can also create my sheet on finish and open the sheet on finish. I'm actually not gonna do that on this one. I'll do that on the next one and then we can kind of get an idea of what uh, the, the prefab manager looks like too. So I'll just say the fabrication service abbreviation 005 and click okay. And then from here, it's just as simple as selecting whatever I want to be included in that spool and clicking finish and you can see that puts it to a half tone and changes it to cyan and that's just a simple view view filter it just looks at my uh, assembly that just got created uh, and creates uh, let's see yep, okay that's okay it's renumbering those elements on selection too and that's just a setting i can have it renumber the elements on selection or not uh, so for my second uh, selection method uh, i'm just going to hit this little drop down right here and click on define spool run. And what this will allow me to do is just select a beginning and an end of my spool. 
And so that I that way I don't have to select every piece in between. You know, in the in the first example I did, it was really easy because I was just able to window over. But in most situations, that's not going to be the case. It's really going to be tight. Um, you know, in this example here, I'll, I'll kind of give and I'll do a couple of different selections here. So for this, I'll just say, OK, and it's going to prompt me, select the beginning and ending parts for school. So I'll select one part where I'd like to start it, that elbow. And let's say I want to end it over here. I'll grab that elbow and then finish and it's going to grab everything in between. So now what's also really nice is you can see that it just went in line. It didn't grab uh, this branch. So I got a couple welds in there, a short piece of pipe and an elbow. So I'm just going to hit escape here and undo and do that selection one more time, but select my branch as well, or that that basically the outermost limits of what I want to constrain or put it put within that spool. So I'll just say okay to my spool name and click OK. And this time I'll select three items, just that one, that one, and that one, and finish. And now it's going to select everything that is encompassed within that group there. So it makes it really, really nice and easy to select spools. And uh, you can actually get pretty complex. You can you can select more more complex situations than that. And it really does a good job at sorting all of that out for you. Of course, if that's not exactly right, you can edit the edit the spool uh, or or undo and you know do it again. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it's already it's saying it's being created and it's renumbering. And that's fine. It just couldn't find a, a numbering rule for a certain part there. All right, so now I have those uh, selected. Uh, what can I do with that? So the next step would be to go to my prefab manager. And again, I could have generated those spools upon uh, selection, but most of the time that's not what people are going to be doing. So you can see here I have uh, my prefab manager. And we can see I have uh, several things in here that are, are blanked out or don't have information in them yet. And they will be when I generate. But we can see that it did create CHWS 005 and 6. Again, if I were to jump to a different service, it would automatically change that abbreviation for me. Um, I also have a package name. That's something that um, we can actually Packaging, think about that as like a, a more broad spool or a spool map. I can actually, you know, with spools, I'm selecting individual items or or uh, nested elements. But with the packaging, I can select uh, individual elements and spools and create, a, again, a larger spool map with that. All right. So uh, let's see. I, I'll go ahead and select both of these. And let's generate a sheet. Uh, you'll notice a lot of other things in here, like calculate view rotation. I'd love to go into all, all of this stuff in detail, but unfortunately, it, it, there's just so much in here that an hour wouldn't be enough. So um, uh, to, in order to keep it moving, I can't go, cover it all, but that one's really nice. Everybody deals with angled buildings or, or buildings that just aren't square to the world. So you can use that and it will actually use or it can use the longest part in that spool to calculate an angle. So in other words, the longest straight within that uh, within that spool, and it'll uh, that way it'll show up nice and square on your spool sheet for you. Uh, this is a pretty basic example, so we don't need to use that, but I'll go ahead and generate the sheets that I have selected. I'll select a title block. And if I had defined this as I select it, I wouldn't have to select it here. And then I can open the created sheets as I, as I generate them. So I'll just click okay, and it's gonna churn through and it's saying, OK, it's asking me to cancel something. Uh, oh, it's just couldn't find the viewport tag. It's no big deal there. Um, what it will do is it's not necessarily an error. It's just uh, letting me know that uh, maybe something is already defined. Uh, it's just warning me that something might not be the way that I want it to be. And we've kind of built in checks all over that, that help with that sort of thing. It really helps troubleshoot along the way. All right, and and yeah, so it's you can see it kind of behind the the prefab manager here, creating those those sheets. Be able to take a look at those in just a second. It made a noise at me. Hopefully, some. Oh yeah, it's still working in the background there. Okay, so I go ahead and close the prefab manager, and we can kind of see what we get, we get here. So you can see that. You know, the spool number has come in, job numbers in there, you know, all of this template stuff that that we come that we provide with out of the box can be co completely customized to, you know, fit anybody's uh, anybody's needs. So but what, what it basically gives us here is a, 
a fully dimensioned, fully tagged view, whatever views I define. Uh, it's giving me a spool bomb. It's giving me a weld map, uh, you know, just again, pre-configured out of the box, give you the welder name, welder ID, signatures uh, boxes here. If we're not using that, that's fine. We can just delete that out. And same with the hanger bomb. We don't have any hangers in this project, so we can just get rid of that. And then if, if there's, you know, other views that make more sense, you know, this is a pretty simple one. Um, so we probably don't need a whole lot of explanation, but actually I, I would say that, you know, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here. So we could look for a different view that might provide a better uh, understanding of, of what's going on. So maybe I like that. I can just drag that down and, uh, and use that along with the rest of the views. And you can see it opened up the other one, very similar here. And all these tags, how they're kind of crowded, we can actually set those to be uh, automatically placed a little bit further away from the pipe. It just depends on the scale of items you're working with. If you're working with pipe or ducts, um, it's really going to be up to you on how those get placed uh, by default. Okay, let me think if there's anything else. I think that pretty much covers it for spooling. So I think uh, we can roll right into hanger placement. And I'm just going to try to uh, keep rolling with everything. Just um, the spools created as we add hangers, as we add sleeves. Uh, we can kind of see that throughout the design process here, uh, getting into quick tools then once we're, once we're through the automation uh, portion. So with hanger placement, that's a, a, this is a big topic too. And again, I just wish I had more time to go through all of these features, but um, we have a few different methods for uh, applying hangers. One would be the ITM hangers. And just really quickly, we'll look at ITM hanger settings. All right. And so really what we have the opportunity to do here is for every uh, type, whether it's duct round, duct rectangular, duct oval, or pipe, uh, pipe work, we can break it down by those uh, four categories. We can do ser by service, we can do by, by material. So for each set of those criteria, which is almost an endless uh, uh, set of possibilities, we can set basically at what size pipe, what spacing do we want? Do we want to add a hanger from the end of the pipe or or uh, or fitting or joint? Or do we want to uh, put a hanger near a branch or a tap? Uh, what hanger type exactly do we want to use at that situation? And do we want to include uh, insulation? Do we want to account for that? Uh, and then we have all these different hanger options too. Collision adjustment for ITM hangers and the uh, RFA hanger placement that we'll talk about next. So what's really cool about this collision adjustment is that it's it's customizable in the way that you know you can choose your movement interval and tolerances. So with the tolerance, that's how close can this hanger rod get to something? You know, maybe you don't want it within uh, six inches of a beam or something. So what's happening is you know these these hangers are pushing the rod up to structure or up to whatever's above it. And it's saying, okay, is there something there other than structure? Um, all right, great. Move it six inches, try again. Move it six inches, try again, and so on until it meets the maximum movement uh, distance. So in this case, I have it set up to two feet. So if I did something like 50 feet, you might be here all day. You know, it's just, it's trying to do that with every single hanger. So you have to be a little bit selective and, and restrictive on how much uh, room you give it, but there's a lot of fe uh, flexibility there. And then if it finds uh, a clash that it just can't resolve, it'll actually highlight it in whatever color you, you'd like. So uh, really nice features there. Uh, let's see here. We also have our embed configurations. We'll kind of look at that on a high level. And our embed options, we'll, we'll look at uh, adding embeds or, or inserts uh, once we get the hangers in. All right, so that's a quick look at the hanger settings. Um, so we'll just go ahead and place some, I think, this will be a good one. Yes, because I think this one will provide a clash so we can kind of see what that does for us. Um, normally, you don't want to see a clash, but you know, in, in a demo situation like this, it'll actually uh, kind of let you see how it works. So I'm just going to tap through the system. And because I have my all my hanger stuff set up, I all I have to do is hit ITM hangers, and it starts placing the hangers. Again, you spend the time up front on this one, and you could theoretically uh, 
window over an entire project and just let it run. And it's going to put the hangers in, in the right spot, or at least, you know, to the best of its ability, there's always going to be adjustment, but, uh, you know, it, it's a very, very good solid system. Now I put this on a no hub system. So it's actually putting fittings on either side, one foot to the either side of each fitting, which is exactly why it didn't resolve this clash. The clash uh, avoidance spacing is really for the for the spacing on straight. You know, every six feet, I want one. Okay, great. It's hit something, move over six inches. But this is locked in at that one foot from the fitting or from the from the coupling. So we can see that it gives me that clash. Okay, now that I know that it's there, I can just move my hanger and then I can come into utilities and colorizer. Oops, colorizer is another one I really don't unfortunately have time to uh, show you today, but clear colors and just select uh, my items there. Oop, I should have done that in a different order. Uh, refresh, not refresh, or clear, clear colors. There we go. And now no more clash. So again, uh, when it does find one, uh, it helps you out with uh, with resolving it. So let's see here. I think I have a different section I wanted to show you here. Yes, right here. So we can see that I have a sloped roof in here. Of course, these hangers are uh, uh, stretching straight up to the structure. Uh, of course, they're following the slope of the pipe. No big deal there. But we can see that they do stop at that uh, uh, at the at the structure. So in many cases, I actually want to uh, uh, extend into the structure just a little bit, depending on what type of insert I'm going to be using. So I'm going to add my uh, embeds right now and adjust those rods based on those rules. So I'm just going to select all of my uh, hangers here, uh, just in the view. And I'm going to go to Evolve Mechanical and click on Rod Adjustments. We'll see a few different things here. We can extend a structure. Now it already is, um, but we'll just keep that checked. We want to uh, embed with the embed depth, which is going to be set over here at what size rod do I want to use? What type of embed uh, do I want to round the rod? So, you know, are we going to be cutting this rod to the 16th or the 32nd, whatever my uh, Revit units are set for? Probably not. You know, so I can set my rounding and my settings to uh, be maybe eighth inch or sixteenth inch, something a little bit more reasonable. So I can choose to use that here or not. And then also, the finally, do I want to add my upper attachments, which is right, uh, which is what is on the right hand side of this here. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK. Again, what that's going to do is it's going to go and evaluate the structure. It's going to evaluate the rod size. It's going to place those embeds. And uh, again, yeah, so we'll, we'll see here. We can see those rods are just slightly pushed up into the structure. We get a physical embed there that is actually attached to the hanger at this point. So that's really nice too. So as you move the design and you move uh, even the pipe, the, the hangers are sticky to the pipe and then the embeds are gonna be sticky to the, to the hanger. So um, it's all really useful. Uh, so if we take a quick look at, I believe our top view here, we can see those embeds and we can see they're labeled with the size, um, just a really nice feature there. Okay, let's look at the uh, other hanger placement we have, and this is gonna be more of a trapeze style hanger. So if we look just really quickly at our hanger placement settings, we can get an idea of the type of flexibility we have here. We can choose either ITM or RFA trapeze style hangers here. I'm gonna choose RFA since I already use the, uh, the ITM style hangers. And so these are, um, pre-configured hangers that we provide that work with this tool. And so we can do multiple tiers uh, for our hangers. We can do what type of insert do we want to have on, a, on the hanger? What type of strut, single, upside down, or double, back-to-back uh, -back strut? We can do our rod configurations, what type of hardware we want to include with these hangers. There's just a lot of information that we can include with these, uh, with these hangers. Uh, and then all of that is going to be schedulable because these are absolutely, you know, just well, they're RFAs, so they're they're going to be schedulable with standard Revit schedules. And again, I unfortunately uh, won't be able to show you a ton on it, but even our ITM hangers have more than your standard ITM hanger uh, as far as parameters go. They're available for you to schedule with native native Revit schedules. Uh, we also have our collision detection in here, so I can enable that or not. Uh, Oh, I guess, yeah, I'll just keep that uh, unchecked there. It's going to basically do the same thing, but we do have another option. So with the other one, it was just movement interval. This one, we actually have a stretch interval. So being that these are trapeze hangers, it might hit something. So 
move it six inches and stretch it or widen it uh, six inches to maybe maybe it's uh, hitting a duct and we, we have the opportunity to go around that duct rather than than through it. So and again, we have the maximum uh, interval for uh, movement and the maximum stretch, just so you're not ending up with, you know, a strut longer than 10 foot or what you could purchase or uh, sitting there all day waiting for a hanger that will never find a clear path, um, you know, trying to find one. So we'll just say okay here. And what's really nice about this tool is that this is, uh, this will actually do our whole run at multiple levels. Again, if I, if I had multiple tiers, again, I, I would have that, that option too. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on my hanger placement. It's going to ask me what profile. And again, I'll select my RFA. I'm going to do an uh, entire path and OK. And it says what uh, select parallel straights. So I'll go ahead and select both of my parallel straights that I want to include this on and finish. And then pick direction to traverse. So which, which direction do I want to go? Now, I'm on, at the beginning of the pipe, so of course I'm going to want to go you know, to the right with it. Um, but if I wanted it to go to the left, depending on the design, I would just select kind of the quadrant or area in the drawing uh, or the project that I'd want to include that. So what's happening here is it opened up a temporary view um, because what I might be in a view that really has everything isolated except for the pipe that I'm using the hangers on. Well, it's not going to clash with it, with anything in that case because there's nothing in that view for it to clash with. So this uh, temporary view that it creates, it just unisolates all items and clashes against that. In the next version we have coming out, it actually elect to, uh, allows you to select the specific view that you can use for that uh, um, for that clash detection. Let's say maybe you have more than one uh, linked model. Um, an architectural and a structure, and you only want to clash it against your structural. And so then you can you can create a custom view that only has those in there. So it's a really nice feature. Okay, so we can see we have a whole bunch more hangers in here. It's um, added these trapeze hangers. It's gone all throughout the entire uh, connected design. So as far as it's connected, it's going to add these hangers. Um, like most of these hanger tools, we're going to end up with uh, probably more than what we're going to actually need in this, you know, for this, in this case, you know, again, it's not, it's not always going to be able to get it right, but it certainly does its best. And in my opinion, it's, it's better to have it add too many than not enough. Uh, it's way easier to, to delete than to, than to add another. So um, let's see here, sleeve placements. Yeah. So that's the last, um, the sleeve placement is the last tool that we're going to look at here, but I think that should sum it up for the bulk of the hanger placement. We're looking at about 30 minutes in, so yeah, I got to keep it moving. Like you said, it's almost difficult to do these uh, these types of demonstrations just because there's so much um, that I just I can't go into it all and uh, try to try to find a balance between the between the two. Um, sleeve tool is very similar in in uh, to the hanger tool in that. It's extremely flexible, and once you set things up, it's just to select your design and go. So looking at these sleeve settings, you could see that I have just two settings or two uh, uh, styles set here, or three, rather. So I have one for ducts, and that's going to be, it's basically saying, what family do I want to use? I'm using this rectangle uh, box-out style, style sleeve. For pipe, I can define floors, or I can define def define it for um, uh, walls. I can do specific types of walls. So at an eight-inch wall, I want it to use this uh, specific sleeve, and for a twelve-inch wall, I want it to use a different sleeve. For the floors, I want it to use a different sleeve, um, and I can even do it so specific pipe uh, services have a specific sleeve. Maybe I have a pipe that. You know, I don't know, a hot water pipe, I need to have a metal sleeve, but maybe it's just fine for my waste piping to have a plastic sleeve. I can do that. Um, so the sky's the limit here with this. I also have box out settings. And what that's going to allow me to do is that if two round sleeves are, uh, or I guess maybe it doesn't have to do be round sleeve, just if two sleeves are within a specified distance of each other, uh, add a box out or, or a, a rectangular sleeve that encompasses the entire area, rather than uh, individual sleeves. So I'm gonna actually gonna change that to six inches because I happen to know that in this particular model that, that provides me an example or a, a, an opportunity to show the manual box out feature. Uh, but once I have everything set, I can say, okay, 
and select uh, over everything. Like I said, I can select my entire project here. And again, now, you know, future future release, um, you know, not trying to, you know, promise uh, or sell a product on a future release, but um, we do have some great functionality coming there too, where we can select uh, specific links instead of just linked models, period. Uh, so you even more flexibility with this, but select my project, hit Evolve Mechanical, and auto place sleeves and it's just going to go through and again place uh, sleeves based on the rules that I had set. So you can see here I got a box out. These two were just close enough. If I were to take a quick measurement here, um, I'm yeah three inches ish there and you can see here here I got two individual sleeves. So if I measure that we should see that I am just over six inches there six and yeah just about seven inches to the outsides of the insulation so let's say all right well that's close enough um i want to go ahead and use a box out there instead of two individual sleeves i can do that with this convert to box out so i'll just select that it's gonna again prompt me with this nice handy dialogue here almost every one of our uh, tools has that and i can move it or have it default to different places in, in my settings um it just basically it's prompted me to you know it's think about it like an old the old uh, old trusty AutoCAD command line. If you were ever stuck, you could just look down to that command line and it would tell you what to do next, basically. So select the sleeve to convert to convert to box outs. So I'll just go ahead and window over those two sleeves, click finish. It's going to open up my box out uh, dialog here, and I can select from a predefined uh, box out, and it'll just fill out these for me. Um, so basically the additional, so if I do don't require host for the box out, um, it's going to change that to the, that will be the length of the sleeve. I want to use the, the box out uh, rules. So in other words, or use the host. So it'll say additional length to the sleeve, additional width and additional depth. And I can adjust these here if I'd like. And that's just how much larger than the opening do you want this sleeve to be? So I'll click OK and replace two sleeves with one box out. So there we go. You should see that it's uh, four inches larger in each direction or total. So two inches on each side. And if we were to look at this in a section view or an elevation view, we'd probably see that it, where we should see that it's two inches larger on either side. Okay, so sleeve placement, that's, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for sleeve placement. So uh, let's see, we're going to look at the accelerating design iteration. So really quickly, we'll look at uh, annotation, and then we'll look at all the different quick tools. And uh, yeah, I think we're just about well on time here. So we'll jump right back into Revit. And again, we're going to just stay right in this model, not make uh, any changes to what I've already done. Um, so looking at the quick tools, uh, starting with annotation, what these are is just a quick annotation tool. Um, what this really is nice because, you know, if you've used annotation or tagging in Revit natively, if you want to tag an elbow with size, great, you can do that. No problem. You can go through and tag all your elbows with size, but let's say now you want to tag it with elevation. Well, now you have to go into annotation settings, change what tag you're using, and then you can go back in and ta uh, tag what you need. So with this, we can actually set, um, you know, all we do, do is just a quick click and place. And these are pre-configured, but we, you can add, I think it's up to 25 of your own. So think about it like this. If you can tag it, if you if it's an attribute or a parameter or a bit of information that you can tag, you could create a custom tag for it. So I just selected my length tag, so I could just come in here, a little hard to see there, and just continue on and click length. I can click multiple and click my length tag, uh, come back in here. Let's say I want to add my size tag. I can do that. Oh, that's number tag, size tag. Oh, there, there it is down there. So you can see it actually gives me uh, the size and it's actually, we, we have it built in so it actually tells you the shape. Uh, might be obvious, sometimes it's not, but I can come in and just select whatever I'd like. I don't have to reinitiate the command every time. And again, no more messing with uh, the annotation settings. Okay. Um, yeah, again, we just give you uh, a handful out of the box, but then you can come in here 
and add add your own. And you can manage them here too. And again, you can set up your custom, you know, do I want to place above left, above right? Do I want to adjust it an additional uh, above or below, or up or down? You can assign uh, different uh, values to that so that they don't come in on your duct or over your pipe uh, if you want it off to the side. So a lot of flexibility there. And that's really how almost all of these tools are going to be designed for uh, lots and lots of flexibility. Okay, let's get into the quick tools. There's a lot to show here, and I'll try to actually show them, show them as much as uh, I can. I'm actually going to unlock this view here. Um, but what's also really nice about a lot of our tools is that we have animations built in. For example, this copy elements. Um, if you hover over uh, completely hands free, I'm just sitting back uh, narrating right now. Um, you basically, it shows you click by click how to use the feature. So this one works really well on um, copying items. You know, if you, it's, you know, fairly simple design right here, uh, just a basic elbow with a pipe going down. But what if you have, you know, valves and uh, threadlets and thermometer ports and just all kinds of different taps on that? It's just basically with a few clicks, you select what do you want to, what do you want to copy? Where do you want to copy it to? Click, 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 and it's going to just uh, paste those items on the uh, on the ends of the pipes. Now again, that's that's for the same service type of thing. Because if I were to if I were to do that on one of these, I would actually have to go in and change my service, which is still honestly probably easier in many certain areas than uh, going in and, and individually selecting and copying, copying, copying over and over again. So that's a really nice tool, the copy elements tool. Um, the multi trim is really nice. Uh, I can use that in a situation right here. And basically it's a multi trim. So you trim or extend. Um, the trim is best used on ITM or RFAs, but my, uh, I, my extend works really well on ITM and RFAs. Basically, again, I get my handy dandy uh, evolved mechanical selection prompt, select first run to uh, trim extend. So I'll just select these two items and click finish. Select second run. So I'll select these two down here, click finish. And it's going to make that connection for me. And again, maintain my service. I don't have to do anything else. That design is done. Um, so moving on down the line, the other nice thing here too is that um, it does prompt me to select again. So if I have another set, um, I can. I don't have to reinitiate the command. Of course, if I am done, I can either hit cancel or uh, just hit escape. Okay, uh, connect elements. So basically in this one, if we have two items and you know when you're pushing and pulling things, uh, this type of scenario can happen pretty easily where uh, pipes get disconnected or maybe you manually move some over uh, and then just a couple of clicks and you basically reconnect those elements. Again, fortunately, I just not, I'm not gonna be able to show every one of these live. So just uh, uh, using these quick tool animations, uh, tool tip animations to, to illustrate them for me. Hopefully it's not too small on your screen to, to see, what they, see what they're doing. Uh, this one I, I will show, uh, spacing and alignment. This one is massively, uh, useful. So I'm going to go into an isometric view, and I think it's going to be best if I change the view maybe to here. Yes, perfect. So you can see here that I put that rack piping in there, but my pipe isn't resting on that rack. The larger one is, but the uh, the smaller pipe here isn't. And we all know how easy this scenario is to have happen when you're drawing, and usually especially on pipe you're drawing on pipe pipe on center. Um, so, you know, if you have a two inch pipe next to a six, six inch pipe, uh, they're not gonna be at the same elevation on the bottom unless you're bottom, drawing bo bottom justification, which can bring its own set of frustrations. So um, we can use this alignment tool to help us out here. All right, so I'll just hit escape. There we go. Basically select my spacing and alignment tool and apply elevation alignment. That's what I'm going to be doing here. My target alignment is going to be by run. I can align it to an edge of something or offset it from something. In this case, I want to offset it from a run. In other words, this pipe right here. And I can also apply run spacing. Um, my So how far apart do I want these pipes? I'm looking at this design and I could probably save some space by uh, bringing these pipes a little bit closer together. So I'll do a gap to two inch. And I could also do equal spacing. Uh, from 
uh, common item. Uh, let's see, I could also, let's see, I have uh, align multiple rows, uh, continuous alignment, and in this case, I'm going to check my include insulation uh, so that it uh, does rest on the insulation rather than go down to the pipe. So I'll click OK, and it says select stationary run. So I'll select this one because I know I want that one to stay where it is. Select all runs in the row and click finish. I'll just select those two, click finish. And you can see it's dropped that pipe down now. It didn't adjust my uh, run here, which is okay. I can I can just do that next. Um, but it dropped all my pipe down to that. So now I can just select that, click OK, select my stationary run, select the run I want, uh, or select the the runs I want to be with my specific spacing. Click OK, and you can see they're tucked together. Now, of course, I could recalculate my hangers to get a little bit more, uh, you know, use less material. So another great reason, you know, to, to actually use this tool for alignment. Not only is your design going to take up less space in the model, you're also going to use less material if you're going to be fabricating your hangers. All right. Uh, that's pretty much it for the alignment tool. Uh, let's see here. Optimize fitting. Let's see. I don't have a ton in here that I could use this on. Uh, so this is going to be used to uh, extend uh, duct fittings in, in, to consume short straights. So if you're fabricating your duct, it's advantageous to have as few short straights as possible because you know your, your full straight can be run in the decoiler. They're cheaper, they're faster, they're easier to make. But if you have to uh, create a short straight, that's basically a fitting at that point. So what we can do is consume a straight next to that item. Uh, next to that run and uh, consume uh, consume that short straight with the fitting that's closest to it. We can do this uh, with, we actually have a setting tolerance. So how long do you want that uh, that throat or that extension to be on that fitting? You can see this, this 90 uh, may not be quite what anybody would want to fabricate. That's probably going to be exceeding somebody's design standards. Um, as far as what they want to extend. So you can actually control that tolerance here. Maybe you only want to extend the throats up to four inches before you don't consider it to be uh, something you'd want to uh, ex extend that into. So I'll use the uh, the uh, tooltip animation here to show, you know, it does have built in, you know, you can extend a fitting one at a time into a short straight, but this tool allows you to do it to the entire project. Again, if as long as your, your settings are set up correctly, you basically just window over all of the fittings you want to include in that selection, window over all of your straights, and uh, then you just hit enter and it will consume those short straights within those fittings. Um, again, anything that's over that minimum tolerance or maximum tolerance, excuse me, won't be included in this. So you can actually, again, if as long as you're confident with your settings, you can window over an entire project and consume all the short straights with a few clicks. Um, Multi-run selection. This is a really nice feature. Um, you know, looking at uh, the one I have next to it here, you know, it's it's not too bad you know i can tab through and select and then hold shift and tab through and so oh, didn't want to do that uh tab through and select uh my next system and tab through and select my next system uh and select multiple uh rows that way or multiple systems that way but with our select multi or multi-run select all i need to do is select one element from each item in that run press enter or finish and it's going to select the entire run. So from there, I could hide it, I could isolate it, I could delete it if I want to, whatever I might need to do, change the elevation, uh, run any one of my other quick tools on it. Uh, so that's just a really nice feature. Um, we have reconnect elements. So it's, again, when you're pushing things around, it's really easy to uh, run into a scenario where you no longer need an offset uh, in this case. Uh, so you can actually just select those and come through and select what you want to get rid of and re or, and reconnect those elements again it's just just fixing a break in that if I oops say deleted or accidentally deleted um, a coupling here all I need to do is select uh, reconnect elements select that hit finish and it's going to go ahead and replace that uh, that coupling for me 
Uh, so the other uh, feature that we have is disconnect elements. And again, this can be really handy. Um, it, you know, Revit loves to maintain or, or sometimes not <laughs> connectivity, but connectivity is very important for Revit. So if you're having trouble and you're trying to slide something over and it's coming with it and you don't want it to, in that case, uh, you can just do disconnect element and select what you want to remove your connection from. It's going to erase or uh, uh, break that connection. And then I could, you know, maybe put an offset in here. All right. Uh, those two, I think, are pretty, pretty straightforward. Let me just, uh, what did it do? There we go. Uh, let's see here. Remove elements. This is another nice one, again, for, uh, you know, design iterations as they kind of go. Um, your offsets aren't always going to be needed. So you can just with a few clicks, reconnect those elements, um, straighten out a run. Maybe, you know, you had a clash with someone and they agreed to move. And so you no longer have to go around them. Nice, nice use of that feature. Uh, the quick dimension tool, very nice uh, functionality here. Perfect view to show that in. Uh, let's say I want to uh, uh, annotate or, or mark with dimensions these two pipes to this grid. I can select my quick dimension tool and just select all three elements, click finish, place where I want to put those dimensions, and it's going to go ahead and place those dimensions in uh, to the best of its ability. Center of the pipe to, the, uh, to that uh, design grid right there. Uh, let's see, add, remove unions. This one's uh, more, more handy on the electrical side or if you're using RFAs, but basically you can place uh, unions at specified intervals or remove those unions. So nice tool, uh, not as common with the ITM workflow, but nonetheless uh, can, be a, can be a useful feature. Uh, let's see, multi-run select. Okay, yep, that's about it for this. Um, we do have a couple of other uh, rotate tools here. We can rotate valves on X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, of course, I wouldn't want to rotate this on the wrong axis because it would just break the uh, break the connectivity that I have. Uh, but if I have a piece of equipment or something, I can just very quickly rotate um, my uh, my uh, uh, element with uh, just a click, click of the button there. Uh, probably more common used would be this MEP rotate tool uh, in, in a situation like this. Let's say, uh, you know, I have this this run here. It's all horizontal. Let's say I want to drop that down uh, and then maybe I'm creating an offset or maybe I'm just supposed to be running down to a piece of equipment. I can select my rotate, MEP rotate, and I can set my angle for rotation, uh, but basically select the elements to rotate. So I'll select these items here. And I think I want to grab that that weld there too, and hit finish, and it's going to rotate that element. And from here, I can just hit enter, and it'll just continuously rotate around that axis. So again, you know, maybe not a huge deal with just a few pipes and and fittings like this, but if you have valves and you know thermometer ports and maybe some expansion loops or something in here. Uh, you know how much of a pain that would be to uh, add all of that to your rotate selection. So this tool makes it really easy to do that. Um, then, then, then actually, shoot, yeah, 10 minutes, 12 minutes left here. We've got one more tool I want to show you. Um, again, if there's any questions, we should have time to, to run through that. Uh, so yeah, the last one I want to show you here is this assign level. So the name of it's a, maybe a little bit deceiving because, yes, it does assign level. Uh, two elements, but it can also copy and move elements. So this is really nice. If I have a design like this, maybe I'm on a multi-story uh, building and I want to uh, copy this design up to the second floor, assign it to the second level. And maybe I want, I have certain elements I want to include with that and certain elements I don't. So it gives me an opportunity to show you one of the features that uh, you actually technically saw in many of the other features that I ran through, but I never went into any detail on. So with this assign level, basically it's saying, all right, what, what level do I want to assign these elements to? So I'm going to want to assign it to level two. What do I want to do? I want to copy, move, reassign. In this case, I'm going to want to copy, and I'm going to want to copy it 12 feet. 
Um, but before I do that, I want to click on this option right here. This is a custom selection configuration. Um, so for an example of why I would want to use this is let's say I want to copy everything except for my flex duct and, and grills here. I want to only do my ITMs or I only want to copy up a specific service. I can actually modify this selection uh, right here. So and, and you could see I, I mentioned where you probably actually saw that icon multiple times before, but it was never pointed out because you can see I can do this for defining spool. I can do this for hanger placement. I can do this for sleeves. And uh, so we looked at all three of those things together today. So technically, the, all of this functionality would have been available there, too. So I'm doing a sign level so I can just click on this. And this is every type of element that I have available in my project to, to select. This is, you know, if you've done any types of uh, view filters or anything like that, this is going to look really familiar, all these different uh, element types. So you can see I have a couple of them deselected already, air terminals and air terminal tags. If I do a search for flex, I should already have my flex ducts uh, unchecked. And of course, then I can also only show uh, my selected items here. So if I if I only need a couple, like let's say maybe I'm only doing ductwork, um, I could actually only show ductwork uh, or whatever selected. And then I could add specific rules. Again, I can say add a condition that the service name is chilled water supply or whatever I might want it to be here. So I have condition uh, conditions in there too. So I'll hit okay. And that's what that's doing there. Uh, so I'll say level two, offset 12 feet, copy the elements, and OK. So again, so, so I don't have to be selective here. I can just window over, and you can see already what didn't get selected. You can see all my other items are selected. What didn't is my flex duct and my air terminals. So I'll click Finish. And it's doing a lot of work here. It's Like I said, it's it's copying the elements. It's moving them up uh, by, this, uh, by 12 feet. It's assigning the level to them. And uh, of course, refreshing the view here. So you can see there, everything is copied in. And if I highlight you know, one of my pipes here, you can see that that's on level one. The one up here is on level two. It's a new elevation. Um, actually, it looks like maybe it uh, copied it a little high there, but you can see that it uh, grabbed everything and copied it up. So that pretty much wraps up the... Uh, the demonstration here, if there aren't any, or if there, I, I, I don't see any questions yet. So if um, there are any, it's a perfect time. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, Here's we have here. a few polls we can run. And oh, perfect. Um, we'll put those out and give you guys some time to uh, submit your questions. Yeah, hopefully I left enough time to do that. <laughs> All right, so our first question here is what percent of projects are done in Revit? So right now, what is the rough estimate of how much you're leveraging BIM for your projects? Now, Seth, I know you're talking to BIM leaders all day long. What, is, what do you see? Uh, do you think that most people are using BIM for more than 50% of their projects? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say at this point, it's 80%. Now, my, my exposure might be a little bit skewed because, you know, I work for a company that makes Revit plugins. But um, yeah, I would say right around right around 80%. And what are we looking at for the poll? 82% uh, of, of people in here. Have uh, 75% or more of their projects in Revit. Very yeah, cool. That's fantastic. All right. And looks like we have a question here. Todd asks, can the tools on the ribbons um, or toolbar be assigned hotkeys? Yes, they can. Yep. We can assign uh, just about all of these hotkeys. Uh, let's see. I know we have a hotkey manager. I forget exactly where that's buried, but yeah, yeah, we can, we can hotkey pretty much everything in the toolbar here. Fantastic. All right, we've question. got another poll here for you guys. What is your biggest BIM struggle? Um, we hear a lot about coordination, coordinating and collaborating. Um, just getting that communication in place can be a struggle for folks. 
accessing useful content. So, and by content, we mean Revit families, um, pre-made Revit content to help you create, uh, you know, repeatable um, uh, designs to help you work faster, annotations, project documentation, uh, spooling or placing hangers. Cool, as those results are coming in, we're seeing answers all across the board. A lot of people saying coordination and collaboration is a big issue, as is um, accessing useful content. And Seth, I know right now um, your team over uh, in the Evolve Mechanical Department are working on creating some more content for the mechanical product. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah. Lucas Espinoza has been hard at work uh, creating a lot of RFA content to be used with our, uh, uh, oh, what is it? The... Uh, I always draw a blank on these tools, family browser. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of great uh, equipment families uh, were, and we're always expanding what we're, uh, what type of content, uh, what, what, what we want to include there. We're actually kind of in the middle of some research actually to find out what's going to be the most useful for our customers. That's right. Yeah, we work hand in hand with our users to make sure we are making the content that they're, they're actually going to implement. And so, yeah, with those results, we're seeing most people seeing um, communication, content, and um, placing hangers also always, always something we hear um, here at Evolve. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, for those who are Evolve customers, there are so many great videos um, on placing hangers in Evolve University. So if you're not signed up for Evolve University, make sure to visit our website and get your team registered. If you're a user, it's accessible to anyone who's already um, using Evolve Mechanical. And there's tons of videos and demonstrations um, to educate your team and build their skill set. All right, just a few more minutes. So please submit your last questions. Uh, we've got one more poll here for you guys. What is the extent, to what extent is the field involved in your BIM? And um, we always just love to hear, you know, how people are finding success in leveraging BIM um, to not only improve their design process, but their prefab process and the field process as well. Um, when those things are all working hand in hand, it's just a, a beautiful matrimony and it gets things uh, um, completed at a high quality and a lot faster, that's for sure. And those results are rolling in. And I love to see that most of you have answered that the field is fully aware and often involved in coordination decisions. That's fantastic to hear mm -hmm. because um, we often see that bringing the best results. Yeah, I, I like that last option there. The field will yell, or call yelling. Um, I think 10 years ago, five years ago, even that would have been much, much higher than that uh, mm -hmm. based on my experience. <laughs> All right, and looks like we've got a question here from Matt asking, do the many Evolve properties slow down a model? That's a great question. It is a great question. Typically, uh, we have not seen any slowdowns just with the uh, the properties themselves. Um, you know, you can, you can see just uh, as an illustration here, um, you know, I, I talked about that extended data and not having a chance to go through it, but you can see all of these different EM properties. Um, it's just information. Um, fortunately, it's not, uh, um, these these properties don't typically tie to anything that's changing something about, you know, toggling something on or off. It's just a text field. Uh, so we found that those are, are pretty light. Uh, so I, I'm not aware of any issues uh, on even large models based just solely on the, uh, the, the, the property being there. Yep, absolutely. And um, just to share my own personal experience, I have had Evolve users come to me and say, since we've switched to Evolve, our load times are down, our waiting times are down. 
Um, we worked with an incredible company, Mark III Construction, and we have a great case study with them where they said they were able to uh, pr produce 30% um, faster because their waiting times were decreased when they made the switch to Evolve Mechanical. And I can drop that case study here in the chat um, for anyone who's interested to see. All right. And with that, we are at time. So I want to thank everybody who has come to the webinar today. We hope that you found this information valuable. Please reach out to us if you are interested in taking next steps with Evolve. If you're already a user and you're interested in getting um, more access to resources, you can always find more demonstrations and videos on the Evolve YouTube channel. That's Evolve MEP. We also provide um, tons of educational videos through the Evolve University platform. Um, and if you aren't um, signed up for that yet, just reach out to the support team and they'll get you going. So thank you, Seth, for the wonderful uh, presentation today. And thank you again, everyone, for coming. Have a great rest yeah. of your day. All right, thanks, all.